It's already done. Power versus force. This conversation is about the concept of living in the end by Neville Goddard. The idea is that once we affirm that we are going to create what we desire, more accurately put, experience in reality what we desire, and once we get the sensation that we know it's going to be so, our goal is to live in the end. And if for whatever reason, we experience fears, doubts, and indecision-based programming in our own mind or externalized as experience on our journey to realize that it is not going to hold us back from experiencing what we truly desire. Before we get into this discussion, I want to play a clip from one of his lectures on how he works with his impression of his desire and we will discuss it in some detail. Now, if I wanted something in this world, and who doesn't, I would formulate an act which would imply that I have it. And then in my imagination, I would simply, having performed that act, I would yield completely to this being within me to execute it. I would fall off into sleep, convinced that he heard me, that he saw my act in faith. All I have to do is to completely yield to this being within me, for he has ways and means I, on this level of my being, know not of. I rise then under compulsion. And under this compulsion, I go through a series of events which will lead up to the fulfillment of that to which I yield. I assume that it's done. And then I commune with myself and gave thanks within me that it is done. So as he stated, if he desired something, then he would construct a scene that implies that he already has what he desires then he would imagine it and fall asleep to the assumption and allow the being within him to externalize it for him. Now, once we have that level of faith and conviction and understanding that it is going to be so, we experience what is called the bridge of incidents, which is the journey. And I always say to value the journey and see it as valuable as the destination. Because if we can do that, then we'll realize that there's no need to have force, no need to be trying so hard or experience moments where we feel like we're waiting, voids, or any kind of problems. If we're experiencing these particular areas, which is usually based on fear, doubt, and indecision-based programming, we have to remember that this was past assumptions that we have. It has nothing to do with bringing forth what we desire. We can call this noise. In my last video, I talked about Steve Jobs and his quote, where he said, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. See, once you have affirmed that you're going to create what you desire, you have a connection within via your intuition, to your inner voice that will guide you to the realization of what you want to create. This inner voice speaks in spirit of harmony, and it also helps you go through a process called purification of the mind, otherwise known as keeping the garden. The mind is the garden, and we yield completely to the being within us, the infinite intelligence of the garden, of the mind, to bring it forth through our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and outer world circumstances changing. In the process, all we can do to make this journey smoother is release ourselves from fear, doubt, and indecision-based programming that may show up on the journey, either in our mind, creating friction, internal turmoil, or in the outer world, 
as experiences in which we interpret as denying the assumption that we are going to bring it forth. Now, when I learned these important concepts, I learned it from Think and Grow Rich. He talked about the concept of definite chief aim and working with the subconscious mind. To create a definite chief aim, create affirmations, work with the subconscious mind, and then realize the end result. And he mentioned following all these other steps outlined in the book, which I did. In the process, I realized over the years, and I read that in 2004, every definite chief aim I've ever created, I was able to bring forth. Now, upon reflection, I also realized that each time I set a definite chief aim, I was experiencing the bridge of incidents as a purification of the mind-based journey. As in, I was identifying fears, doubts, and indecision-based programming, and I would change it using self-talk, audio affirmations, revision, or changing the environment. Fundamentally, there are three things that we can do on the journey. We can change our inner relationship with whatever shows up to be in harmony with it. We can accept it for what it is to be in harmony with it. Or we could let it go to also be in harmony with it. These elements are complementary to the realization of our definite chief aim or what we desire to create. These actions that I just shared with you also help us yield completely. In other words, live in the end. Imagine that you were flawless at this process. You would impress your mind and yield completely, just like Neville said. You would know that it is already done and you would have no fear, doubt, and indecision-based programming at all in your own mind or externalized in form. And depending on where you are on the journey, you can experience this fear, doubt, and indecision-based programming differently and in different ratios. However, this programming cannot hold you back from achieving what you desire unless we interpret it to be so. Let's go a little deeper into the concept of living in the end, which implies that it is already done, the knowingness that it's already done, and nothing is going to be able to stop you from achieving what you exactly imagine to happen. Here's one way of looking at it that could be very powerful. This reality this screen of space is a complete externalization of our consciousness. We have the power to go into our imagination and find what already exists. If we can imagine it, then it already exists. And we can select from our imagination the experience that we want, and we can affirm it. We can confirm it. We can identify with it. We know that it is done. You can feel it through the process that he had outlined. Great process. Now, as a result of doing that, we go down the experience, the journey to the realization or the fulfillment of that particular desire. And on the journey, we have an opportunity to partake in what we call, he calls this, the mental diet, which is essentially removing yourself from information that denies the assumption or releasing certain programming that is within through self-talk, audio affirmations, revision, or environment and bring yourself into a state of presence. As he says here, the present moment is all important for it is only in the present moment that our assumptions can be controlled. The future must become the present in your mind if you would wisely operate the law of assumption. The future becomes the present when you imagine that you already are what you will be when your assumption is fulfilled. Now, if this is experienced as challenging, that's okay. 
We can enjoy the journey and release from the programming. See this as part of the process. In the earlier stages, when I created a definite chief aim, I was riddled with fears, doubts, and indecision-based programming. But I stayed working with the concepts in Thinking Grow Rich, and I was able to release it and bring forth. And from there, my mind had been purified to a certain degree, in which when I created my next definite chief aim, it was easier to bring it forth from a place of flow and autotelic rather than a place of force. If we look at it like this, then we realize that it's okay if we experience force or this trying energy or waiting or void or need or problem based assumptions within. It has nothing to do with whether or not it will bring forth, but rather it provides an opportunity so we can release from that, so we can experience more of a journey of how he identified, yielding completely. And this expresses itself as harmonious thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and outer world circumstance experiences that bring us to the fulfillment of what we desire to create. This is a journey. It's a process. It may not happen overnight, but we can enjoy the journey and the destination. See it as one. The windows of heaven may not be open and the treasure seized by a strong will. Again, force. We're not working with force here. We're working with real power, which is living in the end, which is knowing that it's already done. It's there. If it exists in our imagination, it will be experienced on this outer world screen of space. He says, but they open of themselves and present their treasures as a free gift, a gift that comes when absorption reaches such a degree that it results in a feeling of complete acceptance. So that's the key, acceptance. Realizing that whatever is happening right now is not going to hold you back from achieving the idea that you have impressed on what you desire to create, knowing that that's the case. And if you have challenges with it, you could work with subconscious mind audio, self-talk, revision, or changing the environment and saturating your mind with information that shows you how you can achieve your goals. Certainly, that's what I did when I set my first handful of definite chief aims. I ensured that I surrounded myself with as much people, environment, circumstance, and information that was encouraging and supportive of what I desired to create, saturating the mind. What are we? We are, in a way, garden keepers. We keep the garden of our mind, and we yield to what we have planted in the garden of mind to externalize it in reality. One visual that can help you really well with this is imagine planting a seed in the garden of your mind that grows into a tree that branches out into this outer world and externalizes as the fruits, brings forth the fruits from the tree that's planted within. We are yielding to this experience. Let's talk about letting go of force-based trying or waiting. One of the things that can happen on this journey of where we are right now and where we want to be, which is the experience brought forth, is what happens in between and our interpretations of it based on our beliefs in which we identify trying really hard as part of the journey or sitting around waiting, being bored as part of the journey. The truth is that your inner voice reveals to you how to bring it forth. Hunches, inspirations, synchronicities, signs, inspired action is revealed to you within. My first definite chief aim was to get out of $50,000 debt. I set this when I was 24 years old. And I remember as soon as I committed to it and followed the process in Think and Grow Rich, I started to get all these ideas of how to reduce my expenses, put together a spreadsheet, and I started to become very joyous in the process. I started to enjoy it. I used to get fascinated about learning about finances. All of a sudden, I never even had those kind of thoughts before. What I also realized is that opportunities were showing up and I started making even more money 
and I was able to get out of debt a lot faster. The same thing happened in 2009 when I left corporate and started my IT business. I followed the same kind of process. More from Think and Grow Rich, although I believe that this particular process that Neville articulated, which is what I work with nowadays, is very powerful and accurate. And I found myself, when I started the IT business, all of a sudden, in certain opportunities, they just seemed to reveal themselves, hunches and inspirations within. Now, I still had fears, doubts, and indecision, certainly. I wasn't completely purified in the mind, and I still don't believe that I am, but I also enjoyed the journey of constant purification of the mind. And I did the same process. I purified my mind. I said, any kind of fears, doubts, and indecisions that I'm experiencing on my journey between starting the entrepreneurial endeavor and bringing it to the level of success that I wanted, which is at that time 50 IT clients, which I grew it up to by 2012. Any kind of fears, doubts, and indecision-based programming has nothing to do with me bringing it forth. Those are past impressions on my subconscious mind that for some reason I'm interpreting as holding me back or creating force or any kind of experiences in this outer world reality or my own mind, internal turmoil within that seems to create more friction on the journey and I can release it. He says, however much you seem to be living in a material world, you are actually living in a world of imagination. The outer physical events of life are the fruit of forgotten blossom times, results of previous and usually forgotten states of consciousness. They are the ends running true to oft times forgotten imaginative origins. So I realize, and we can reflect upon this and realize it from our own experience. Two ways of creating success, I always mention, and there's varying degrees in between. One from a place of force, one from a place of autotelic flow and yielding completely to the being within or a varying degree, which is going to be determined by our interpretations of what he calls here ends running true to oft times forgotten imaginative origins, past programming. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's going to hinder us from creating what we desire. We can only assume that, and we don't want to assume that, because then we're making it a lot more challenging. He says, the drama of life is a psychological one, and the whole of it is written and produced by your assumptions within. We experience reality as a complete externalization of our consciousness which is revealed in the outer world and in our inner world through our beliefs and our assumptions of how we believe ourselves to be in relation to our experiences as well as what we desire to create. And the goal, the ideal, is maintaining living in the end, knowing that it's already done and we don't need to stress ourselves out, try and wait, because if we believe that's the case, then we're going to create that in our experiences. It is not related to the definite chief aim. I remember Napoleon Hill saying this in Thinking Grow Rich. He said, if you believe that money is a result of hard work alone, perish the thought. And when I first came across this idea, I battled with it. I said, wait a second, I've always created money through hard work. How could this be so? I maintained open to the idea. I allowed that idea to saturate my mind. And then what I found was I found more flow-based and autotelic-based opportunities, doing what I love to do and I enjoy doing to create money, more and more so each day. And then I started to taper away from it, and then I realized with absolute precision, and I identified with the programming, which I learned from The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. He says, Money was a result of creating products and services that was needed and useful. I began to identify with that programming. It's one way of looking at it. It's not the only way, but I chose to do it. And I said, I like creating products and services that are needed and useful. I find joy and bliss in the challenge of doing it. And then all of a sudden I started releasing from the hard work idea. And then I identified with what Napoleon Hill talked about in Think and Grow Rich, which was 
All I have to do is multiply the quality of service, quantity of service, and spirit of service, and it has nothing to do with force. And as I identified with it, my bridge of incidents leading to the realization of entrepreneurial goals ended up reflecting accordingly. As he states here, the drama of life is a psychological one. So I changed it in the psychology. And the whole of it is written and produced by your assumptions. Learn the art of assumption, for only in this way can you create your own happiness. Willingly identify yourself with that which you most desire, knowing that it will find expression through you. So we impress it in the garden of the mind. And it is expressed through us, and we allow it yield completely to the related thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and outer world circumstances that reflect the seed that we impressed, the idea, the vision, that which we desire to create. Another thing we want to do is we want to let go of the void between now and the realization of our definite chief aim, of our vision, that which we desire to create. Because if we feel this void, then we feel a, a gap and it seems tense and we're waiting around and we don't know when it's going to happen and we're creating unnecessary convolution and confusion. And when we identify with convolution and confusion, will start doing convoluted and complex things, masquerading it as accomplishment. I call this busy work masquerading as accomplishment. Now, they still get to the destination. And we don't want to create the assumption that it was a result of the added complexity and convolution. There are many that get to that destination without that convolution and complexity. And there are many that get to the destination with that convolution and that complexity. But why would we want to create unnecessary complexity? Well, that's a choice. A lot of times we do it to fill the void. The truth is that we allow the being within to externalize it in ways that we don't necessarily consciously understand right now. That's the power of working with the subconscious, the realm of infinite intelligence. And we do the inspired action. Now, as I began to identify with this level of understanding more so in my entrepreneurial journey, I started to meet entrepreneurs who represented that mood within me. They would talk about how they wouldn't necessarily do something unless they know it needs to get done and they don't make it complex. And if others say to them, hey, you got to do this and you got to do that and that's how you create success, they say, maybe. I choose to do it this other way. I'm going to figure it out. And they do. They find the way within and they're able to create accordingly. Because they know it's done. And they don't have to create unnecessary complexity and forcing and trying unless they want to. Unless they want to have that experience. He says, you and I are creatures of habit. We get into the habit of accepting as final the evidence of our senses. See, if we observe based on past assumptions and beliefs that we've identified with, that everyone around us is doing it from a place of force and stress and frustration, that's the evidence of the five senses. What I've realized is it's better to go in and connect with your inner voice that's going to reveal to you the way that is accurate, which may be contrarian to the experiences of the other people, because that is a result, as he put here. They are the ends running true to oft times forgotten imaginative origins. The outer physical events of life, what is presented here in the screen of space, are the fruit of forgotten blossom times a lot of times, results of previous and usually forgotten states of consciousness. He says, when you say you know a thing, but you cannot explain it, I say you do not know it, for when you really know it, you naturally express it. So once we have impressed the seed of our idea on our subconscious, we allow the being within us to externalize it. And we know when we have impressed, when in that moment, we get the 
affirmation. Naturally, at that moment. So, from my experience, living in the end, as how he speaks about it, is maintaining it through the mental diets by releasing fears, doubts, and indecision programming, knowing that it's not necessarily going to hold us back unless we identify with the assumption that it is holding us back, whatever those externalizations are in the outer world or imaginal potentialities based on that past programming in our inner world, unless we believe it. But to make this journey one with less friction, we remember that it has nothing to do with us creating what we desire. It's done. And all we can do is release that, keeping the garden of the mind. As he says here, in prayer, you are called upon to believe that you possess what your reason and your senses deny. See, if we go back to what is happening here, that the outer world is an externalization of previous states of consciousness, plus what we have impressed that we want to create, the vision, that end result that implies that we already have it, then it's a mix and match of those externalizations from within, interpreted as reason by the five senses, which may be affirmative or from a place of denial. If it's from a place of denial, we'll experience a void or neediness or problems between where we are right now and our destination. And what we do is we purify the mind. Subconscious mind audio, self-talk, revision, and environment are the only ways that I use. And as a result, we let go of force-based trying, waiting, forcing, which again adds unnecessary complexity and convolution. If you want it, then you could do it that way, certainly. But that's the difference between power versus force. And a good book to read is Power Versus Force by David Hawkins. I find that to be very complementary to what Neville talks about. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.